How many of you glazed over when you heard a nuclear topic in Idaho Falls? <laughs> More than likely a few of you. So we're going to get rid of the safety glasses with side shields. We'll put on real glasses. I don't even need glasses tonight. I know what I'm talking about. What I want to talk about, and it kind of follows with George, energy policy. My degree is in political science. I'd argue we don't have an energy policy. So I'm not going to go into the nuts and bolts. I apologize to my nuclear engineer friends. I'm not going to talk about how the reactors work or why they work or why they're safe. But as, a, as people, I think we can all recognize that when we hear a word, we automatically get a mental image with it. Like, for instance, if I say the word mountains, we're all going to see a mountain range in our minds. It's going to be our favorite mountain range, some place that we've had a really good experience. We want to go back there again. Unless you've had a really bad experience, then you're going to think about the beach. But overall, I think, you know, as humans, we can say, yeah, we all get this same mental image in our, in our heads. If I say capital, most of us are going to see the U.S. Capitol. Now, this one, the feelings are going to run the gamut. There's going to be good, bad. There's going to be a lot in between. So let's not dwell on the capital. How about we say apple pie? We all see the same thing. Even if you don't like pie, which is crazy, I think, but <laughs> even if you don't like pie, we have this image, whether it's grandma's pie or something you saw in a magazine, we see the same thing. Now, if I were to say the word nuclear, what mental images come to mind? Now, for those of us in southeastern Idaho, probably we're all going to see the INL, we're going to see buses. Those are our images. But as a nation, as a people and society, Here's a fun one to do. Go to Google Images. Just type in the word nuclear. What's the first image that's going to pop up? <laughs> that's your first image on Google Images. So I said, okay, let's be fair. We'll check Bing and Yahoo. Well, that's the other one. It's not the same detonation, but it's still a detonation. So let's, you know, let's acknowledge the elephant in the room. The world's introduction to anything nuclear was through weaponry. So if I say the word Hiroshima, what picture do we all get? We get destruction from 1945. And I'll admit it, I, that's what I see as well. But I'm trying to challenge myself to say, okay, that's not necessarily the way things are today. How many of you know what Hiroshima looks like today? It's a pretty vibrant city. How many of you would think of that image when somebody says the word Hiroshima? Probably not many of us. I mean, unless you go search for it, you're not going to see that. Now, today, nuclear energy is actually, any polling you look at, nuclear energy is favored as part of that all of the above energy strategy, which I firmly agree with. That's not to say, you know, forget the past, you know, just barrel ahead. But we're accepting that, yeah, that's probably part of it. Even politicians, whether they're debating or pontificating about energy, they're pretty much all going to say, yeah, I support nuclear. But listen for this one. They all put a qualifier on it. They won't just say, yeah, I support nuclear energy. They say, I support safe nuclear energy, which to me implies that what we're doing now has not been safe, which I'd argue till the cows come home is not the case, that it is very safe. But they all have to throw that qualifier in there. And folks that are speaking against it, not only do they want to use those images that bring up bad, bad feelings, you know, mushroom clouds and destroyed cities, they also want to put a lot of very emotion-laden words with it. They call it evil and toxic and deadly and all these other things. We don't do that with everything else. So tonight, I'll give you a few images of what I think we should think of when we hear the word nuclear. First one, experimental breeder reactor one, hence the shirt tonight. Um, EBR-1 was the first reactor built at the National Reactor Testing Station, the first of 52 reactors to be built out there in the desert, first in the world to make a usable amount of electricity. They did that on December 20th, 1951. They lit all of four light bulbs, and then the next day they lit the building. But from there through the end of its operating life, the end of 1963, they generated their own electricity. It's now a registered National Historic Landmark. It's open every summer for people to see and learn what the nuclear world, how the nuclear power industry really got started. There are other really impressive images from the 50s. We had Borax 3, the boiling water reactor experiment that lit Arco, Idaho on July 17, 1955 for about an hour in the middle of the night. 
but it was all the electricity Arco needed to make them the first city or, well, town in the world entirely powered by nuclear power. And by the way, because of that, if you haven't heard, you can celebrate Atomic Days in Arco every summer on the Saturday closest to Je July 17th, and it's pretty fun. Um, but let's think about other images from the 1950s. I mean, people, we were seeing a lot of goofy things. Well, not we, I wasn't there then, but my dad was seeing goofy things in the 50s. You know, our presidents were, well, future presidents were selling cigarettes in these lovely Christmas boxes. And yeah, babies wanted mom to light up before they got mad at them. <laughs> the country was also learning about nuclear topics from Hollywood. Apparently, and I, I, I don't want to delve into this too deeply, but if you're a male and you're exposed to a big radiation exposure, you're going to shrink down to the size of, you just can't even be seen, you've got to fight spiders with a straight needle. Uh, if you're a woman exposed to radiation, you're going to grow to 50 feet tall and wreak havoc on everybody in your path. <laughs> That's how Americans were learning about nuclear topics, if you will. And of course, Godzilla, everybody's favorite. But the reality was, while those things were happening, those images were happening in the world, or in the, at least in the U.S., great things were happening for nuclear research. The Materials Test Reactor, MTR, built out here in the desert, operated, began operating in 52, and they started all that research. What do you build reactors out of? How do you build your nuclear fuel to operate efficiently, economically, safely? All of that was being done in the early 50s. And not only that, they went a step further besides just the, the power plant research, but they saw these other great things that could be done with what they were learning. The bottom right image, they were already working on food irradiation, a way to preserve or extend shelf life, but also to kill foodborne illnesses. And today, the, US, the, well, the USDA, they've approved that we can irradiate foods, different meats and leafy vegetables to get rid of crop diseases and things that hurt us. You know, it's improved our quality of life, whether we know it or not. All the spices in your cupboard have been irradiated. Also in the 50s, the birth of the nuclear navy, starting with the first prototype for nuclear sub out here on the desert. And then in 1954, USS Nautilus was launched and commissioned, and the US could then have a presence virtually anywhere in the world, including under the North Pole. You know, they were the first ones to make it under the North Pole because of nuclear propulsion, nuclear power. In 1954, in Russia, the Obninsk nuclear power plant. Now, it wasn't big. It only generated five megawatts of electricity. That covers about 4,500 homes. But they started putting electricity on the grid back in the 50s. Uh, the UK was second in 1956 with Calder Hall, Calder Hall 1. Uh, they were 50 megawatts, so about 40,000 homes. And then the US jumped in with Shipping Port in 1957 in Pennsylvania. That was a 68 megawatt reactor, so they could supply about 50,000 homes, a little over 50,000 homes, but the U.S. was now part of it. Nuclear power was growing the whole time, but I don't know if we always recognize that long history of what was being learned and done. Not everything done in the 50s turned out that great. Early in the 50s, the U.S. thought we had learned that the Russians or Soviets had nuclear-powered bombers. And this was early in the Cold War, when the Cold War was heating up, so we said, well, geez, if the Soviets have one, we need one. And also at the time, we didn't have intercontinental ballistic missiles, and we couldn't refuel bombers in flight safely. So this was going to be our first strike deterrent. So we built a couple of reactors out here and figured out, yeah, these work. They hooked them up to ramjet engines. I read somewhere they got 44,000 horsepower out of them, which in the mid-50s was pretty dang impressive. The downside was the weight to thrust ratios kind of fell apart on them because out of the two reactors they built these two designs, the lighter one was 226 tons without any radiation shielding. So even at 44,000 horsepower, yeah, it's not gonna work real well. Not everything worked, but they tried and they did it safely. My favorite part of my presentation, let's go back and think about other things, other images in the 50s. <laughs> Apparently in the 50s, it was a good idea to transport your babies wrapped in cellophane. Men were better than women. And that's the one thing, kill an afternoon. Look at vintage ads. Boy, women were just, wow, that was horrible. As a dad with two daughters, it kind of disturbs me. 
but it also scares me. I probably know guys, some rednecks around here that still think this way. <laughs> Luckily, they don't say it out loud, though. <laughs> At least not when their wives are around. But these were the images we had. So let's move on into the 60s and 70s. Where is nuclear? Experimental breeder reactor number two, operated for 30 years. Incredibly successful. In fact, the one thing I always think of when I think of EBR2 are the safety tests that they did in 1986 when they proved nuclear power plants can be built inherently safe. You don't need engineered systems or operator actions to protect the plant. They did things with that reactor nobody had dared to do, and the reactor took care of itself. Simple laws of physics. Thermal expansion, convection currents, you can't melt it down. We were doing work on how do we make sure the current fleet of reactors are operating. The loss of fluid test was an international effort. A number of countries pooled resources to build this test reactor to make sure safety systems worked. The last two experiments they did, they did exactly what happened at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. They melted fuel on purpose to make sure we understood it. Then all of that went into the computer codes that we still use today that allow designers to make sure, yeah, what we're building is going to operate safely. Another great one, one of my favorites, the transient reactor test, my very simplistic explanation, this is like Ford or GM building a car, then they crash that car into a concrete block to see how it protects things. That's what the transient reactor test did with test fuels from other nuclear power plants. They could put the fuels in and just like slamming it into a concrete block, they would destroy it. It would shatter, it would melt, but they watched how that happened. And then they could des design things to be safer and make sure that if the operators do it all wrong or things break, the fuel is still really tough. One more. Well, actually, I have two more. When you start finding them, you want to just keep putting them in your presentation because they're so funny. But, you know, things are kind of evolving. You know, it's not quite as bad. It's still bad. Okay. Not quite as, yeah, it's bad. Nuclear images have evolved. And I'll bet without much thinking, most of you can pretty quickly come up with what you think our latest nuclear image is. We watched Fukushima happen on television. We watched it happen. What else is happening in Japan today? How is the recovery going for the rest of the country away from the power plant? I have no idea because the news, all we ever see is Fukushima. We're focused on that. I mean, over 20,000 people died, not because of that reactor, but because of the earthquake and tsunami. We've forgotten that. Our nuclear image that goes with the topic is bad things. It's not all bad. We have the largest materials test reactor here in Idaho doing research for the Navy, for the current fleet of reactors, for the next evolution of reactors. We have world-class facilities to examine that material so we understand it. We have world-class researchers. They're collaborating around the globe. This week and part of next, we have 20 South Koreans here collaborating with our nuclear scientists. I mean, the work is being done and we're learning something new every day. And one of the neatest ones for me, we're starting to apply tools that have been used for all these other scientific disciplines. We're applying those tools to nuclear research. We're the first ones in the world to get radioactive samples into microscopes that were built for other things, but we're starting to do that now. And we just keep growing and learning more and more. So I guess my challenge is technology evolves. You know, you're no longer going to pay 3,400 bucks for 10 megabytes of a, a hard drive. And if you think about Skype or FaceTime on our iPhones, you're not thinking the Western Electric, you know, a black and white TV and a telephone. Our ideas of technology have evolved and grown, except for nuclear. Like I said, most of the time when we hear nuclear, we see mushroom clouds or destruction. Yes, nuclear power and nuclear weapons came from the same roots. You know, that same science. They took very different paths. They have very different applications and end results. And I think we do ourselves a disservice when we think about them like that. If we start seeing nuclear power for what it is, they're just a power plant. It's their base load electricity, it's putting power on the grid very cost effectively, incredibly safely, and there are still even better ways to do it. 
but we don't think about those things. Those images kind of get in our way. Likewise, it, when in the debate ever comes up, one of the big ones, what do you do with nuclear fuel in our images, partly thanks to the Simpsons, which by the way I do like, but <laughs> the Simpsons tell us that radioactive waste, it's green oozy slime in barrels haphazard, haphazardly stacked around somewhere. The reality is new, used fuel can be stored very safely underwater to let it cool, then you move it into a concrete cask. I've leaned against one of these concrete vaults, not these in the photograph, but we've got our own that I've leaned against, and I'm here to tell the tale. We can store it very safely, and we've got a lot of options. For me, when I hear the word nuclear, because of where I work, my images are the advanced test reactor core, that beautiful Sharinkov effect, blue glow. It's the brand new fuel for the next evolution in power plants. They're not the nasty you know, mushroom clouds because you know, I'm lucky, I get to work in that and I get to see those images. My challenge is when you hear these things, words like nuclear power, open your mind to other images. It's, there are other images out there. You may have to look for them, but they're there. Go find those images and challenge the way you think because if we don't, these debates are gonna go on well into my kids' lifetime and I don't think we ought to do that. So. Thank you very much.